Well, thank you very much, Bill, and good afternoon, everyone. It's absolutely an honor to be delivering the Coelho Lecture today, so thank you very much for inviting me, and it's good to have all of you in my home port of D.C. Welcome to D.C. as well. Uh, I would like to um, discuss the destabilization of Internet governance. It's motivated in part by a new book that I have coming out. It's an edited volume called The Turn to Infrastructure in Internet Governance which is about the ways in which governments and other forces are co-opting the infrastructure uh, of the internet for political purposes, having nothing to do with keeping the internet operational. So that is a phenomenon. And I'm uh, current, that's coming out in December, but I'm, we're also working on a new uh, single authored book about rethinking internet freedom. So I'm gonna tie um, in this lecture elements of each of these concepts, infrastructure and internet freedom. And it's a good time to think or rethink internet freedom because uh, the internet, uh, in my opinion, will soon turn 50. There are different ways to measure that, but it will turn 50 based on the 1969 milestone uh, when the first packets were sent bet between research sites on the ARPANET. 50 years is a really long time. Uh, 10 years is an eternity when it comes um, to the internet and internet governance. Um, much has happened to reorient us in the last 10 years. Sometimes it's helpful to think back where we were 10 years ago. The Facebook was just launched at Harvard. <laughs> um, on February 14th of, let's say, 2005, uh, 10 years ago, the domain name YouTube.com was activated. In 2005, the United Nations had its first report on the Internet of Things, one of many to come. And I was putting the finishing touches, as you know, Bill, uh, on my doctoral dissertation on IPv6, a, uh, an internet protocol, something only this crowd could uh, appreciate. Uh, but since then, so much has happened. Uh, too many things to uh, even recount, but the birth of Twitter and Reddit, drones, Google Glasses, the iPhone, the mobile internet access in the emerging market, the so-called Arab Spring, the Egyptian internet outage, and Snowden NSA surveillance, disclosures. So much has happened. The internet has grown to 3 billion people. This will soon grow to 5 billion with mo most of this growth in the developing world with people accessing the internet from their mobile phones. So by many measures, this has all been quite successful. Right? We, it has changed the way we work and shop and live and communicate with each other. It has launched new industries, uh, new businesses, entirely new uh, kinds of multinational companies. You know, it, a lot of things have um, gone very well. Um, every single sector in the developing world and in, in some cases in emerging markets are completely dependent upon the internet to function. But one of the points I'd like to make here is that just because things have gone fairly well, we can't take the stability and the continued growth of the internet for granted. Of course, the internet itself has constantly changed over the past 50 years. We know that. You know, I would say the most notable developments were the 1990s rise of uh, the web. For those of us on the internet um, before, we, we remember the birth of the web, its internationalization. Absolutely the rise of social media the global surge in mobile phones. Um, but there's something else that has changed. And this is a, a concept that I'm developing now, is that the internet's no longer a communication system. It's also a control system in which more things than people are connected. Society is moving from a world in which content is digitally mediated to one in which all of life is digitally mediated. Already measured in billions, think about uh, the types of objects that are online. Bill billions of objects. And some estimates say that this will grow to 50 billion objects. If you count home alarm systems and cars, weather sensors, industrial control sensors, surveillance, monitors, you know, particularly when you walk around Washington, you see this whole infrastructure. So in cyberspace, the Internet of Things is um, we can't even use that term anymore. It's morphing into the Internet of Self, aggregating not only cyber physical systems as we know now, but also everything from com tied to a person, from communication to the things around the person to the commercial transactions and increasingly biometric identification. So what are the prospects of Internet freedom in this context is the question I'd like to pose. 
What it means is that internet freedom is no longer just about content. Internet freedom is no longer just about communication. Fundamental human rights depend upon an underlying system of technical infrastructure that can create the conditions for civil liberties online. Now, these conditions are not preordained, but they have to be deliberately designed into the system, just like they always have. Now, since the Internet's inception, I'd also like to suggest, and I'm drawing from the Internet Society. Michael is uh, organizing a, a very interesting Internet Society event tomorrow, so I'll tie it in with that. The Internet Society has, uh, which uh, for those of you who are not familiar with it, it's the um, not-for-profit organizational home of the Internet Engineering Task Force and other things. They've described these characteristics or principles, the design principles, as Internet invariants. And I think that's an appropriate way to call it, the enduring principles that have shaped, to some extent, how the internet has been uh, designed and also run. Now, these norms include uh, things like global reach, the idea that uh, it's a, a potentiality for any end device connected to the internet to connect to any other end device, regardless of location. And we remember a time when that wasn't possible and interoperability between devices, no matter what manufacturer has created these devices. <clears throat> I also like their concept of permissionless innovation. That's a very important one, where anyone is able to introduce uh, new services, new applications, new devices without having a gatekeeper's consent. And of course, things related to governance, accessibility, uh, general purpose support, uh, collaboration among stakeholders, mutual agreement, uh, many, uh, many principles that have resulted in an environment in which there are no permanent favorites. And there's always the, the choice of the uh, possibility of change and innovation. <clears throat> I think um, internet engineer Leslie Daigle probably said it best in an article that she wrote. I'll just read from it. A network that does not have these characteristics is a lesser thing than the internet as it has been experienced to date. So while these are imperfect, while they're always marked by their own uh, politics, they um, involve competing values, um, tensions between different stakeholders, it has, um, these have contributed to the growth of the internet and to its architectural capacity for innovation and global reach. Now part of what has maintained these stable characteristics, in my opinion, is a, a stable system of internet governance that we take for granted. The internet is governed, but there's no single system. Despite how we read about it in um, the Washington Post or people's Twitter, but there's not one system. It's an entire ecosystem of functions. Um, I, would just, I usually describe internet governance as the administration and the coordination of the technologies that are necessary to keep the internet operational, and then the enactment of substantive policy around that. But it's not one task. It's many different tasks. Uh, control of um, or administration <coughs> of names and numbers by ICANN, by um, domain name registrars by the registries that operate the domain name system and also the US government historically has had um, an oversight role on that but we call that critical internet resources of names and numbers protocol parameters very necessary to keep the internet operational there's also the establishment of technical standards by many different institutions including the Internet Engineering Task Force the World Wide Web the IEEE, many, many different things. And these are the rules that enable interoperability between devices and uh, may have a lot of specifications, compression, error checking, privacy, encryption, all those kinds of things. They're the uh, blueprints for how everything is built. There's also interconnection coordination, the forgotten part of uh, internet governance. It's not one network. The internet is obviously many different networks, and in order for that to happen, there has to be interconnection between different network operator uh, systems. They, that usually happens via private contracts between the operators, either uh, at bilateral connection points or at shared internet exchange points. There's also cybersecurity governance that's a little better known of an area, and also the policy-making role of private companies. 
That's why internet governance is not a great term for this, because that usually implies governments. But private information intermediaries like Google and Facebook set policy through their terms of service, through their decisions about how speech, intellectual property, privacy, and reputational issues proceed online. And of course, across all of these areas, governments um, establish laws and, and policies about, um, within borders about identity theft, privacy, uh, intellectual property. So, so governments are absolutely a part of this as well. Now, these are technical functions, but they're also public policy functions. Um, my dissertation, uh, quite a long time ago, was about the most technical protocol you can imagine. But what I did is I established the idea that, um, you know, which actually came from my dissertation advisor, Janet Abate, who wrote Inventing the Internet, that protocols are politics by other means. So all of these different functions perform a technical function, technical functions, but um, they also establish public policy. For example, how web standards are developed affects accessibility for the disabled. It doesn't just happen, it has to be designed into the system. Uh, social media services make decisions about individual privacy and freedom of speech. For example, do you allow anonymity or do you have to have, can you use a pseudonym, for example? Access regulation, such as net neutrality, um, affects many things, competition and innovation. So these are policy areas, even though they're um, yeah, I look at this through the lens of being an engineer, but I also have to look at this through the lens of being a social scientist and seeing the public policy issues within all of these functions. So these are very real policy issues. So, so just the, the acts of keeping the internet running establish public policy. But there's way more than that happening now. There are some conflicts over in these internet governance functions which have been very high profile and they have um, contributed to uh, contention around the world. So the most well-known one, of course, is the uncertainty over the transition of US oversight over some aspects of internet governance. Now, while there's no single system of internet, internet governance, there are uh, some uh, coordinating functions that require centralized oversight. And the administration of internet names, the domain names like cnn.com, and the internet addresses, the you know, 0, 1, 1, 0, 0, 1, the binary, um, each one of those has to be global unique, globally unique. So there's some central coordination required. And the US government has had um, a historic role in its contract with ICANN, which was established in 1998. And because the US uh, authorizes changes to what's called the root zone file, which is the highest level, you know, central mapping of top level domains like .com, .uk, et cetera, and uh, the IP address space. So mapping the names and the numbers. Um, most, almost everyone, and certainly everyone in this room knows that the Obama administration announced a transition. Uh, the, de the first deadline has been extended. So this is definitely something to watch over the coming year, how this unfolds. So that's already happening. What's going to happen with the new election? And there are a lot, of, a lot of questions. It will be really interesting to see how this unfolds, how, how the transition unfolds. But another, I would call, destabilizing factor that has been going on for quite some time is an increasing loss of trust in the systems of internet governance. And so this is not uh, just something I'm making up. Um, this is, you know, we can quantitatively prove this. Uh, I was part of, I'm a senior fellow of the Center for International Governance Innovation, and we did a poll, uh, the CG Ipsos poll on um, internet security and trust. And we polled approximately 23,000 internet users in 24 countries. And we found, this was, um, uh, about a year ago, we found that two-thirds of users were more concerned about digital privacy than they had been the previous year. There are many different explanations for this. Increasing public awareness of um, government surveillance is definitely one of them in parts of the world. But we also have um, some loss of trust because of the high-profile security breacher, breaches 
including the Office of Personnel Management in the US, including Target, including the Sony breaches. So there have been a lot of high profile security problems. So, um, so that's, that's definitely the case. Now a third existing destabilizing factor is um, what I'm calling the turn to infrastructure in internet governance. And that's the subject of the book, that's, uh, the edited volume that's coming out in December. So what that means is that having nothing to do with keeping the internet operational, we have governments and other forces turning to the actual infrastructure to do certain things, using the infrastructure to um, uh, take down dissident sites or take down government sites via uh, denial of service attacks, for example, or the Egyptian internet outage, turning to the infrastructure to cut off access, or using internet infrastructure to um, enforce intellectual property rights. So this is very, very well established. Uh, this has been um, happening for uh, quite a while, this recognition that infrastructure is a means to advance various kinds of external goals. This is well understood. But what I would like to suggest is that we need to, to extend that concept a little bit because uh, we'll call that governance by internet infrastructure. But now we are seeing a governance by tampering with internet infrastructure. Tampering with internet infrastructure. And this tells me that the stability of the infrastructure is being taken for granted. We're talking about systems that resolve hundreds of billions of queries per day. Uh, what will this do to the security and the stability of the internet? So it helps to give some specific examples of where that's ha this is happening. Where are the attempts to tamper with the very design of the systems of, of internet architecture? One that jumps to mind is encryption. We're, we've always had encryption wars. That's what people call them, crypto wars. We, um, we have people here involved um, in these intimately in the 1990s, the 1990s crypto wars. Are we in another era of crypto wars is the question. Yes. We are. <laughs> That's right. Um, so, so what we're seeing is attempts by governments or at least government interest in weakening the security of the internet by building back doors into encryption technologies to achieve various uh, goals like national security and law enforcement. So uh, those are very important goals, but is it necessary to build in security vulnerabilities um, in order to do that? So um, are, we in, are we in the next crypto wars? I would say yes. Um, and it's not just uh, governments. There's, there's kind of a balance and interest by the technical community in strengthening encryption. We saw that immediately after the NSA uh, surveillance disclosures by Snowden, where the Internet Engineering Task Force said, well, let's harden the internet with encryption. So that there, there's that. Um, they view pervasive surveillance as a technical attack. Right, so let's fix it with encryption. That, that's, that's one thing going on. Google announced and other companies that it would um, improve, uh, um, always use things like encrypted HTTPS connections. So companies are responding with, to security problems with, um, with new kinds of encryption or standards for encryption. But one government response has been the call to build in backdoors. Uh, there was, uh, we're in Washington, there was a hearing on the Hill uh, very recently, and um, you know, there were discussions about this. The FBI director in the U.S. has criticized corporate efforts to implement end-to-end -end encryption. This is a debate going on right now. In the U.K., there's a proposed bill to require private technology companies to, um, to build backdoors to user data. I'm not sure where that stands right now, but that's been uh, being discussed. So one problem with the, these backdoors is, uh, no matter how well-meaning, is that they build inherent security vulnerabilities that could be exploited for other purposes. So in my opinion, it takes a great amount of faith and maybe hubris to think that you know, the, the people trying to do bad things on the internet won't get ahead of this. Um, and you know, certain governments are already working on this. So um, building those vulnerabilities is one of the things that I wanted to suggest as a, an example of the turn to tampering with infrastructure. Let me give just a couple more examples, and then I'd love to open it up for discussion. A second attempt to tamper with 
infrastructure involves data localization laws, which in my opinion promote fragmentation rather than universality. Internet infrastructure, now again putting the engineer hat on, um, you know, this, but, but what I'm saying is very obvious, it just simply doesn't map neatly onto borders because it's not just physical infrastructure. There's logical infrastructure and um, virtual resources and institutional. Um, it, it's amorphous at all levels of the uh, technology, all the layers of technology. Even exchanges of information within a single country could pass through an internet exchange point in another country. Right? That's just a fact. That's the, that may not be what we want, but that's a fact. Uh, companies can locate customer data centers and support centers anywhere in the world. So that customer data is not going to be in a single country. Um, a retail company with a .com address can reside anywhere in the world. So this affects companies far beyond the tech industry. Um, McKinsey wrote an interesting uh, report about data localization implications for the financial services sector. It's not just the tech companies. Many co companies have networks that span the globe and have distributed workforces. But in the world of the tech companies, think about content distribution networks. The whole purpose of that is to distribute data so that it's um, efficient and close to users. Uh, large content companies like Google distribute data around the world. There's a lot of caching. There's replication. So um, a, a, I think a significant shift in policy making has been the introduction of laws around the world that would uh, specify where private data is held. So much of this interest has uh, come from uh, concerns about foreign surveillance. So it is um, con a concern with privacy in many ways. A Russian law um, requiring Russia, companies doing business in Russia is going into effect very soon. Um, so there are many examples of this around the world. Let's say that um, Professor Dutton and I decide it's just not working out for us in academia. And we decide to do something else and we start a company. You and I start a new company. We're working on our business plan. We want to develop a new social media company. And we want to have services around the world. How can we possibly locate servers in every country in which we do business? So you can see about the effects on innovation and entrepreneurial activity, um, just as one example. It may even have civil liberties implications if you're uh, collecting data in um, uh, like a, a single location. And in some cases, foreign surveillance is easier in that environment because the same kinds of limitations and restrictions don't apply in other jurisdictions. So I just raise that as another question and um, a statement of, of some of the trends that are happening. And then finally, I'll just toss out the example of uh, use of the domain name system. So the domain name system, which translates between internet name and numbers, has been used for content control for quite a while. We know that uh, the, in the US, the Immigration and Customs Enforcement arm of the um, Homeland Security uh, Department uses that for um, blocking access to um, like Louis Vuitton knockoffs.com or uh, some kind of a site that has pirated movies and music. So we know that's been happening. But, uh, and also it's being used for censorship in parts of the world. But is the DNS being uh, modified now? Not, not going to the actual registry that has the authoritative record of how a name maps into a number but asking for local DNS redirection, where instead of changing the authoritative record, you're changing these records locally. So local DNS, um, local DNS injection, local DNS redirection. It's a very technical topic, but it's something that is um, it's on the table right now, and it's being used. So when we have a system that alters the universal record, Strange things can happen. There was a, an example when Pakistan Telecom was asked to uh, block something on YouTube that got replicated into the broader internet, and YouTube was actually down for a while. So, so this can have effects on the entire internet. So that's happening as well. OK, 
considering the hundreds of billions of queries and considering how important this system is to the operation of the internet, I just raise that as another question. Should we be tampering with how that works? So um, I'll just sum up by saying that the future of um, governance and of internet governance should consider infrastructure. It should consider <clears throat> not only the things we've always been concerned about, civil liberties, innovation, growth, but it really should concern the technology itself, which is often taken for granted. So the three policy examples that I described, uh, the encryption backdoors, the data localization, and the DNS alterations, they share several characteristics. What are some of these? They're all examples of government interest in not just using the infrastructure, but changing the infrastructure to enact certain goals. They all raise questions about the implications of these kinds of activities, alterations, I would call them, for the stability and uh, the security of the internet itself, as well as for civil liberties. Each of these kinds of changes also raises the question of, um, you know, and I, I don't want to suggest that we have a universal internet now, right? But we have the prospect of universality. There are many barriers that exist. But this changes the possibility of the expansion and, um, you know, heaping on to this universality, instead introducing fragmentation, fragmented institutional structures, fragmented protocols, fragmented um, infrastructure. They also suggest the types of security concerns that can arise when these kinds of changes are made. Encryption backdoors weaken security. Data localization approaches can concentrate rather than distribute data, so therefore can serve as targets for um, data breaches. DNS modifications can, compl can complicate the implementation of um, DNS cryptographic approaches uh, that are designed to Im increase the security of the DNS, like DNS security. They also help emphasize the competing values that always exist in internet governance. We know, we've known that for a long time, that's obvious. Um, oh, we, we always have competing values and contradictory values in some cases. In the examples that I gave, on the one hand, governments are seeking to protect citizen privacy, for example, with data localization requirements. And on the other, they're seeking to um, have encryption backdoors to be able to access citizen data. So those are contradictory values, just in these few examples. So regardless of which values prevail, um, it is increasingly important to, uh, when, when we're looking at internet governance, to look at this tampering issue. And I use that, I use that word tampering just to make a point. That's, that's an extreme um, value-laden word in and of itself. But maybe alterations in the infrastructure that are politically motivated is a more um, appropriate way to say it. Um, so the bottom line is that internet governance and architecture is um, absolutely a proxy for state power. And this assertion of state power by seeking modifications to internet architecture, it has to be accompanied by a concern for the implications of this for the actual stability and security of the internet itself. So that's the point I, I wanted to uh, suggest today. And I really appreciate the opportunity to discuss this and look forward to our discussion. Thank you very much. Excellent. I, I'm going to open it up for questions around the table. But I just want to make sure I understand the framework. I agree there are all these stabilizing, uh, destabilizing forces. But I would count one, and I'm just wondering where it fits into your framework, as just the rise of national and regional policy, like take right to be forgotten in the privacy area with the German courts or the French uh, French uh, uh, Isabel Facquart Perron's uh, announcements as the French uh, uh, Data Protection Authority, uh, creating, creating um, uh, national policy, uh, trying to apply them globally. I mean, this, this is a huge change. But that's, to me, that's not an infrastructure thing. And I'm not, it's a policy shift, which right. um, 
Is that fall into what you call the transition of U.S. oversight? Or is the, uh, the right to be forgotten, which I think has uh, its own problems and you know, conflicting values between free speech and privacy, that, is, that doesn't tamper with the actual infrastructure, in my opinion. So I would say that that's an, that's an example of the rise of national policies, absolutely. But it's, a, it's slightly further from the infrastructure than some of these other things. But um, there always have been um, national policies about the internet, right? Always. There yeah. always have been. Yeah. Um, ma in many cases, uh, it has been at the content level. And some have also been at the um, institutional level, you know, where uh, c companies have had certain um, requirements imposed upon them, including the right to be forgotten now. But there's an awareness of the actual infrastructure of the internet, how that's governed, and the possibilities for new forms of power by leveraging that infrastructure in some cases. But I think this rise of the national policies is a big part of this. And the reason that we see this increasingly is because the internet has just become so important for national economies and our social life. So that's a big change in the last 10 years. And the internet was um, very important 10 years ago, but now every sector of most economies depends upon it. So you can understand why there would be a great deal of attention towards that. Laura, great talk as always. Yeah. I, 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 I do think that we have to make a distinction between regulation and tampering of the internet and then regulation and legal tampering of things on top <laughs> of the internet. And a lot of times we go to the internet governance forum and people completely confuse what we're talking about. So we'll be one minute talking about what Facebook is doing or even what, new, what new business models are being built on the net. And then other people will start talking about the infrastructure and proposing one grand, glorious scheme to regulate everything. So what you've done is incredibly helpful to distinguish between the, the wires and the domain name system and the rest. But I, I, I guess I, I'd love to hear your take on what happened this week in India, where we had a proposal from the Indian government to require that all internet companies store 90 days worth of customer data unencrypted. Any, you know, this isn't just who's sending an email to somebody. This is like all the content. And it, it was this blanket proposal. Um, and it, so it was a data retention requirement, but it was also an anti-encryption requirement. Now there was a huge pushback. They have Within withdrawn. days, they, they withdraw. Yeah, yeah. yeah, it was really quite interesting how quickly that was fixed. But um, it brings to mind uh, the biggest question for me, which is when governments start imposing these constraints on the infrastructure and requiring companies, this, this, this regulation could have affected Cloudflare and would have just put us out of business in India. And we could have just we had to close down and stop serving content to people in India because it would have added colossal cost. You know, our core competency is throwing away data. That's what we do. Um, to save nine, 90 days of data would have been outrageous. And a total change of the infrastructure that we've built to better serve our customers. So the two questions, what do you think of the Indian case? And how can we make people realize the innovation in the infrastructure layer that it does not happen these constraints get put on things. Well, that example is, um, it's related to all of the massive security breaches that we've had. Because you can't go on to a news aggregation site, you know, for those of us who follow tech policy, on any given day and not see a data breach, something about a data breach. And so if you, if you suddenly have a policy where you're storing customer data unencrypted like that, you can't assume that people um, who are trying to enact identity theft, um, data breaches uh, for other reasons, um, are not going to be um, attracted to that. Um, I mean, it'll be magnetic yeah. when something like that happens. Honeypot. It's the world's largest honeypot when that happens. So that I think just from a security standpoint, that's a really bad idea 
to do that and to have requirements for that. But uh, the, the issue that you raised is, is, a, is even another issue. How does it affect innovation, the uh, ability for businesses to, do, to enact the services that they enact? Um, and then there's another layer on that, and it's the civil liberties implications of um, you know, individuals. It, it was, in my understanding is it was all data, right? It was yeah. all so data. This, this, was, this was our worst nightmare. Data localization, data had to be in India. It was data retention, 90 days of data, and it was opposing encryption, which is at the core of our business. I mean, that's, that's why people trust us, so we can give them end-to-end -end encryption for free, right. which of course would never be possible if we had to somehow gather every bit that moves through our network every day. What was the motivation behind that? Well, your point was one of them. It was, you know, that they were afraid that if the data was stored someplace outside of India, that other countries or bad people would get it. But the bigger concern was surveillance by the Indian law enforcement. We right. had the case in Mumbai where Pakistanis were using blackberries and they could not easily get to the data that those terrorists were exchanging between themselves. So it's sort of a, Brazil has had the same thing. They've gotten very mad at Google with, about seven or eight years ago, we had the Orkut social media platform that was only popular in Brazil and Indonesia. But some bad people were using it. And when Brazilian cops went to Google and said, hand over these files from these bad people who are using Orkut, Google was, hey, you want an office in your country. <laughs> so there's a little bit of, of control for surveillance purposes. Yeah, this. But the amazing uh, thing is how quickly it was withdrawn. And I, I don't know. Right. Who I think made it, the right phone call. Yeah. part of the issue is that. Um, so, so experts in internet governance in this room, you know, no one person can know everything even about. It's it's such a, a capacious subject. There's so much to it. Um, even just the area of technical standard setting, such a broad area. So many different kinds of technologies. And you're, if you're a policymaker, your job is not to be an expert on the technology or how the technology works. And I think that um, you know, having more bridge-spanning people and you know, bridge builders that can explain the connection between policy and the technical infrastructure could be very helpful. And then th this is one example. I think part of it was that there was um, an immediate understanding of, oh, well, maybe this um, isn't, doesn't make sense from the standpoint of technology and the business community. I think that a lot of people pushed back against it, but that's a that's a great they example. Didn't get that pushback before they went public with the proposal. It was, it was vague to begin with, but right. what you could understand was just so opposed. To right. I completely agree with you, but are there examples of, of good, maybe good examples of data lo localization? Let's say sure. Sure. a bank that decides that it writes a contract for using cloud services but saying, I want this all in Switzerland, or I want the Swiss bank wants to make sure that all the data or all the processes Absolutely. Place in there. Yes, yeah, some, some data localization is, um, is important, whether f because of efficiency or where customers are. But it's, it, you know, that's a, a decision based on the unique circumstances of whoever the provider is or whoever the company is which is completely different than the top-down like, imposition of where you have to locate data, right? I mean, oh, certainly, I mean, look, think about all the server farms that exist around the world. And um, so, so sometimes we want data localization. But in general, it's an incredibly inefficient way to run the cloud. The, the one point that you can make is that there are certain types of data, very limited data sets, like the keys to your encryption, which there are various banking regulations and also HIPAA regulations that say you've got to hang on to your keys and don't put those in the cloud if the cloud is going to be in five different countries. And some of us are working on solutions to do that, which is called keyless at, uh, SSL. And we'll even you to keep your keys on your premises, but still do encrypted communications around the world. We, we want. 
government records uh, localized within the country. I mean, just to give the most obvious example, like you could, you would never hear of a, you know, there are some very sensitive data that you would want within the country, and in some cases, it depends on what the application is. No. Yeah. All right. The studians just decided this. they That's wanted right. all their data somewhere else. Yeah. In place, in place I There are some country invaded and took over. There's some of U.S. government data right. that is absolutely in the U.S. and that's the the right of the you know the government has a right to do that in the same way that a company has a right to store it the way they want. So. You can secure your yes. data better in an international cloud than you can in a server in your basement. I mean, that's what policy makers that's don't another, understand that. That's another another issue about you know where is it most secure, but um, there are you know there are many examples of data localization. Hillary Clinton. Other other <laughs> questions. So or? I was wondering, Laura, whether you could say a little bit more about what do you think the main forces are for those those conflicts that you pointed out, and so the fact that now there's national interest emerging, I think, is seems one component, but for me that's not sufficient really to explain the things that are going on. And I'm wondering whether there must be deeper forces at work. Either it's forces of technology, uh, there is sort of, there is, there is maybe the experience with the internet is kind of far now richer than it was before. I mean, the whole internet project started with a lot of very um, forward-looking, fantastic, revolutionary expectations, right? And some of those have materialized, but some of them haven't materialized. And, and, and some of those are actually the outcome of the way governance was structured in the past. Because one could actually argue that the security problems that we currently face, to some degree, are related to choices that were made in the 60s and 70s and nobody really anticipated what, what the long-term implications might be. And so that's not to say that sort of government is the right force to, to respond to those things. But I think there's a growing sense that the, the existing internet governance structures has failed in many areas to deliver what what some of the promises were, or there's new unanticipated effects, and so we fall back to government. But maybe maybe this is just a transition, and maybe maybe multi-stakeholder governance, we know it will morph into something else. Maybe government will morph into something else, or we will come up with sort of some new overarching structure that addresses those things. I mean, probably more and more people are aware of the fact that. Many of those governance institutions are sort of not really trusteeship relationships. I mean, there's some people from companies and some people from uh, from advocacy groups who are all very, very well motivated, but that that's not necessarily the same trustee relationship that at least formally government claims to have from its citizens, right? And so I think maybe maybe it's those those facts now come to a boiling point, right? And it requires some rethinking as to how how we address those issues. Well, there's really a lot in that uh, yeah. statement, <laughs> right? Uh, yeah, there's a, there's a lot in that statement, right? <laughs> right. Um, I would start by um, addressing the multi-stakeholder issue. And what I usually like to start with when I, did, when I talk about this with my students, and um, you know, you've, you've talked about this, is that we, we don't really have a multi-stakeholder model now. We have, um, if you look at internet governance writ large, in some cases, governments have responsibility for certain aspects of this, not with other people. Uh, in some cases, it resides with the private sector making decisions about certain things. And then this other category of things that are truly multi-stakeholder, and I would say the ICANN, uh, you know, management of names and numbers is probably the best example of that. That involves um, private industry, civil society, governments, right? So that's, that's multi-stakeholder. So the, do we want to go from um, multi-stakeholder to something else? That question applies really to ICANN and to some other functions that have that kind of multi-stakeholder um, approach now. Now, the, if you read some of the documents that have been submitted in advance of the 10-year uh, anniversary of the World Summit on the Information Society, there'll be a big United Nations General Assembly meeting about this later this year. Uh, there seem to be a lot of um, uh, points of input that are suggesting, let's go to multilateral control of names and numbers. Right? And that's been a tension that has existed all along. Part of that tension is because of um, international concern about the unique relationship of the US government 
over, over those functions. And it seems uh, very important to continue to internationalize that and keep it multi-stakeholder so that it doesn't just go from, uh, in, in my opinion, there should be no one entity that controls um, these shared public goods. So it shouldn't, the keys shouldn't be handed to um, a single other government. It, I think it really should stay multi-stakeholder. But in other areas, I don't think we need to have that as a goal. I think you know, if, if things are working with government control over things or in the private industry, that's fine. So there's a lot of diversity in that. The other thing that you raised that was really interesting was the question of why now? Why is there so much attention to the infrastructure now? And I think that, that probably there are many different answers to that. One is the, just the, the fact that we've had a lot of high profile events around the internet. What are the highest, pro I mean, you'd have to say Snowden's NSA um, disclosures are the highest, one of the highest profile. WikiLeaks was another one. Some of the data breaches, um, I would say the internet Egyptian um, outage was um, absolutely another one. There's more awareness of the, of the dark web. There's more awareness of uh, the systems of censorship that exist in uh, China and other countries. So these, these now are in the public consciousness in, and also in the uh, sites of policymakers who are hyper aware of all of these issues. So high profile events. I think this, and I um, mentioned this before, but the fact that the internet is, um, there are dependencies on the internet for the economy and for all sectors of the economy. That has focused attention on it as well. And then I think there's a, just recognition that um, of the actual infrastructure and the ways that that can be uh, a point of control over different things. Um, it's not worth getting into now, but I, I did um, publish a paper, The Emergence of Contention in Internet Governance, you know, that does look at some of those issues that I co-wrote. Because I have that same question. Why do we have this emergence of contention? So the, you know, the big thing of, that's on the, the elephant in the middle of the internet governance room now is, um, is who's going, how will ICANN, how will management of internet uh, resources of names and numbers unfold? So that, that's the most contentious one, but there are these other areas as well. I mean, part is just a matter of timing, I just want to add to it. And you see it in a lot of other policy areas too. Because what happens is you embark on a new project, and you don't really anticipate fully what, what the outcomes might be. So you have a vision that is typically sort of some, you know, glorious and grand. But as, as time evolves, as experience accumulates, you'll see much clearer what the deviations are between your vision and the reality. Mm -hmm. and, and in many areas then, you know, the existing framework of handling issues is blamed for not achieving the vision in its original way. But so there's this backlash. And so you see those cycles in a lot of political areas. I mean, the, the not existing regime it's always privileged over the existing one because you don't yet see its flaws, right? Kind of, but you only see its potential benefits. Right? And so I, that, that is in play here too, that, that we see much clearer now what sort of some of the strengths and some of the weaknesses are also are of the existing framework. And I think there's probably very little that can be done about it. I mean, it's, it's, I think it's purely a matter of time. So you see you see things of, of policy switching, of regime, regime switching. But it, it, now the pendulum comes back at some point because you know, move the new system. You, you come back uh, uh, and realize how it was learned. And, and I think about more specifically, let's say, the whole project of liberalization in the 1980s, how badly it has succeeded, uh, failed in some areas, and how well it has succeeded in others. And yet there is this huge backlash in many areas against it. Um, and it's, I think, and maybe that's a, that's a play too. I mean, it would be a, a big wave that, that would be difficult to control, actually. It's bigger than we are. There's also the issue of technological change, I just want to say, right? Like, yes. the Internet of Things um, is here, and the Internet of Things is not yet an Internet, right? I mean, there's, there's fragmentation there, there's, you know, new kinds of standards. Um, so um, I would just throw technological change into the mix, too. I think there's another, another answer, though, particularly with the United Nations. The growing contention there is partly a result of the glowing, growing politicization of these debates. So you're seeing countries deciding they're going to object to what the U.S. wants because they want something else in a trade agreement that's going on over here. Or they want some money for a development project at a different U.N. agency. If there's all this horse trading now that's going on. You, you, you see this when 
India stands up and blocks the renewal of the Internet Governance Forum. Everybody thinks the Internet Governance Forum is very useful. The Indians can't come up with any explanation as to why they opposed having the United Nations renew its mandate. Clearly, it was sort of a way of you know, taking a chip and saying, I'm holding on to this until you give me something I want. And that's pure politics. And we see it all the time in the UN. I was just over in Brussels, Berlin, and Warsaw. The same thing starting to happen there, where the political parties are kind of taking positions opposite each other just to take positions. We're seeing it here with ICANN and the IANA transition, where if Obama wants it, we're against it. And it, it, there's no deep analysis going on. It's just, unfortunately, the injection of partisan politics or geopolitics into these issues. Could I just uh, take a little bit of a chairman's prerogative and, and because we're running out of time and I don't want you, I don't know where you suggest we're going to end up. That is, uh, I understand the destabilizing forces, but where will, where do you see this moving? What, how will this be resolved? What's, what do you think is the future of internet governance uh, based on your own thinking through this? Well, I think it will continue to be contentious. Um, it has been contentious for a long time. I think uh, what could happen is um, if we have security, continued security breaches, or if we have an operational problem with the domain name system, that would really raise attention to some of these things. Um, but I'm, um, despite the name of uh, the title of the talk, I, I feel fairly positive about the future. I, I think that we're going in the right direction in standard setting in many cases and building new security features in. I think um, it, it, I, I feel like certain things need to be resolved, though. This tension between um, on the encryption side is definitely one of them. You and I have talked about the tension on the anonymity side. We're almost at the point where you can't have anonymity anymore. So there are things that will need to be resolved. But um, you know, just one final thought, and this is where I, I really get excited about the future. We probably will not use the word internet in um, you know, in our lifetime. Because the history indicates that there always will be technological developments where things are supplanted, whether we call it cyberspace or something else. When everything is connected, we, it may not make sense to even use the term internet anymore. So that, it, that will complicate governance in really profound ways because we can't think of it as a separate domain of government government, of governance, but rather one that is highly privatized, you know, the privatization of governance, and one that um, seeps into every aspect of our lives, including, I hope someday, a driverless car that I can ride around in. Can I, can I add one more Yogi Berra quote? Oh, please, yes. My favorite one. If you don't know where you're going, you're unlikely to get there. <laughs> <laughs> Excellent. Which speaks to this point about the lack of a vision. What, yeah. what a self-governing internet could look like in 10 years. So uh, get used to contention, <laughs> but it still will work. Somehow it'll still be functional in your, in your view. OK. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. But I, I will keep using the term internet. But otherwise, so, so will I. I, I totally agree. <laughs> so will I. <laughs> That's right. Anyway, thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much. That's brilliant. I mean, yeah. it's really clear and um, wide ranging and excellent. It's, it's going to be a great video. And right. Uh, so, Laura, uh, can I probably ask you one question specifically. Yes. Yeah, yeah. And yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. most specific. Yeah, yeah. I just retweeted that. So. And so, you know, we, we use these terms, we use them uh, with great uh, ambition and, and sort of great positive intentions. Okay. But so this whole notion of, of permission-free innovation, right? I mean, it's, it's wide, widely used and everything. And it's generally a good idea, I think. But and I would like to relate it to freedom, for example. Right? Because there's this notion of freedom, that freedom means that you are, uh, nobody has any control over you. But there's also, there's a different view of freedom, too. And that is, Freedom means that, that nobody has control over you, but you also don't act and affect others, right? So what the, what the economists call externalities. And so a situation where my freedom actually causes a lot of problems for others would not be true freedom in that, in that sense. And I think that's, that's the, the, the position I actually uh, subscribe to. 
You have to and remember, so, Johannes is chair of the department. He, I'm not sure he's careful with his uh, permission-free innovation. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, and so, so, so there could be types of innovations, right? The the the, the permission-free that would flourish, but they mm -hmm. have enormous negative consequences for them. I mean, if you think about the whole mobile app space, for example, it's a right? total security problem, uh, and it's it's. There's many, many security holes. Uh, we have you know, we have permission-free innovation, but that causes a lot of issues for the whole ecosystem. Wouldn't that be, I mean, isn't that like a tension that somehow we have to come to groups with? I mean, sort of some are permission-free as long as it doesn't cause negative effects for the whole ecosystem or sort of some contingency. Yeah, well, um, and, and I don't want to speak for the internet society and what they mean by per permissionless innovation, but the way I view it and, and interpret it is that you don't have to get permission to hook into the network, right? That there's not a gatekeeper, so you can introduce um, a website into the internet, or you can introduce um, a, a network and then connect in to the rest of the network. Now you can do lots of harms when you do that, or the people who are already connected can do lots of harms. So my point is, wouldn't it make sense to somehow come up with sort of some threshold, some minimal standards that you have to meet in order to? The, the, the problem, problem with that is, you know, imagine if there was a gatekeeper and to review every website that people wanted to put up. Yeah. You could paralyze change. That's the right. hope is if there's enough uh, self-critical response in the network as a whole that malicious innovations will be sniffed out and pushed back by the network. Yeah, That's the cool. alternative to having a gatekeeper. They, they always masquerade as beneficial, right? And they never announce oh. themselves as being malicious. Right. Um, Thank you. I mean, I, the, the European treatment of freedom is different. They see the animal freedom as the freedom for anybody to do whatever they want. Mm -hmm. Americans like that. But the notion of legal freedom, that we have a legal system, that we accept the regulation because that ensures our freedom within a domain that we choose for ourselves. That's closer to what we would like for our life and for the internet. Uh, but that also implies trusting the enforces of the legal framework not to unduly correct what people will do. I think we're in an early stage here. We, we better, better, we would trust we better take go. off. Right. <laughs> big, big you can ride together, together in a taxi. Do you guys all know each other, by the way? Oh, you don't. I'm so, yeah. Hi, Bill. I'm Jeff Goldstone. All right.